<laughs> excited guys excited chapter 6 lullabies of the lost ah welcome back everyone hope you're having a great and amazing day today guys hope you're doing good hope you're excited for another wonderful episode i wonder how many episodes there are because this is i don't think this story is that long so i maybe this is the last chapter and i hope they fall in love i really 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 do i really really do i want to see them in love yeah Anyways, let's go. After staying up all night, exchanging bittersweet memories with a vampire, I should have been more than ready to fall into a hundred years slumber. Yet I toss and turn for hours. My mind is once again filled with loctus. But instead of wheeling questions, this time it's the they whisper ideas. I stride out of my chambers with a groan, wrecking my hand through my haphazard bedhead. I sit harder and intend to do a blast. Oh, and, and 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 I intend at the blasting writing desk, and I steadily begin to write. I could write the truth, just as I did when I sang before at the Queen and the Court. I would write the truth about this vampire who has been banished and, and abandoned to an abandoned estate. People need to know that this humanity is not lost, as as they say. When I get out of here, people will know. My quill scrawls to a stop. When I get out of here, how many songs have I played for him now? On the lunar eclipse, I played my tenth song. Earlier tonight must have been my thirteenth. I still have a way to go before I'm free, but I've never made significant ahead. I've, but I've made significant a headway on my debt to him. No use thinking about it now. I still have time to decide what I want to do. I nod to myself and bow my head as I continue writing. I wake slowly to a light pattering from rain outside, with my desk pressed against it, with my uh, with my cheek pressed against the desk and drool peeping from the side of my lip. Barely, I wipe my mouth and squint at the loose leaf in front of me. I had written only two legible verses before I was overtaken by exhaustion. The rest were either bitterly scratched out or scarcely decipherable. Ah, oh, I sigh. Reaching up my scratched head and promptly knock over the inkwell. Shit! I hiss out another string of curses as the ink spreads around the desk and drips off the side. Instinctively, I save the journal and end up sacrificing my meager verse to the fast spreading black pond. Oh, damn it, damn it, what a waste! Ah, oh, what's wrong with me lately? Lucius is going to be so angry with me. Where is the damn cleaning cloth he always uses? I turn to and fro, and realize with growing dismay that he always seems to have it on hand. He must keep it in person. Maybe. Maybe he has a spare up in the, in, in the rafters. Maybe he's keeping multiple rags near his person. To be safe, I search through all of the cabinets downstairs like a pelican raccoon. Not a single rag turns up. Knowing that Lucius will be even angrier if I use blanket or, oh God forbid, a curtain to clean up the mess. It seems I have no choice but to venture upstairs. My hand traces the familiar cracks and bumps of the cobblestone walls. A tactical map, a tactile map I've learned to use due to, ab to the abysmal lighting of the stairways. There are no windows to light my path, and the torches must have burned themselves down to smoldering husk an eternity ago. As I climb, I try to plant my feet toward the edge of the each step. Not only to keep my balance, but to reduce the chance of stepping on a groaning center plank. As a general policy, I found it's best to avoid making undue noise. Unwinded by the time I reach the highest point of the state and embrace myself by resting my palms on my knees. Who, who in heaven's decide it was a good idea to build something with so many stairs? I want to give him a piece of my mind. I spent the next half hour carefully rifling through the attic. There's an annoying number of decorative boxes and trinkets up here, and not nearly enough cleaning rags. I jerk to a stop as I wrench open a jewelry box and see the contents within, realizing with abrupt horror how many action mirrors the person who killed Lucius artist. What? And realize with abrupt horror how, uh, how my actions mirror the person who killed Lucius artist? Rifling through his things. Oh, now I get it. I don't intend to steal anything. Lucius won't see me. I should still have another hour or two before he wakes up. But... 
I take a slow breath, willing myself to calm down. Even if Lucius X irritable sometimes, he never hesitates to forgive me. In the same way, I've never hesitated to forgive him. I find myself fixating on a peculiar point within the open jewelry box. There's an oddly familiar sight here. A hint of a small engraved shape that tugs at my memory. I didn't notice it immediately because it's partially buried beneath strings of pearls and gemstones. I gently shift the valuable aside, allowing the subject of my focus to be laid bare. It's a chunky ornate ring. Quite gorgy, really, and not something I'd ever seen wearing. I pluck the item out of the box, peering at it in a dim, dim darkness. There's no way. At the center, at the ring's center, is an enormous opal stone, which glitters like a rainbow of fire. Carved directly into the stone is a crest I recognize from the guardsmen's shields and from the banners adoring the queen's courtroom. Without thinking, I put the ring in my mouth and bite down the shanks. It's tasty, yuck. But I can feel the marks from my teeth imprinted into the metal. The body of the ring is made of pure gold. An actual, genuine royal signet ring. Did a member of the crown barter for their freedom with this? Or, or maybe it was stolen and then traded by our thief. Because it, it can't be that a scream cuts through the entire edict and threatens to burst my eardrums. I fumble and nearly drop the ring. I crammed the ring back into the jewelry box, slamming it shut before wheeling around. The noise definitely came from the coffin. L Lucius? As I call out, I met with another scream, even more frantic and agonizing than the first. The wooded box is trembling, tremoring hard enough that I worried it may topple over. I approach the noise, every bone in my body shrieks for me to stay away, but my tremendous concern for him overwhelms every ounce of fear I have. The coffin is scarfed from black thorn wood, with small devout imperfections chipped off the edge, it's definitely fallen over before. I wrap my knuckles gently against the wood, no definitely that I no, no differently than I knock on a bedroom door. Lucius? Can you hear me? The coffin like thuds as if in response. It continues to thud over and over as Lucius pounds his fists against the side surface. Let me out! His roar is followed by a terrible desperate noise of nails clawing against the wood. Lucius, it's me, it's Abigail, are you hurt? Stop! Stop this at once, I beg you. Release me. I command you to release me this instant. Okay, okay, I'll let you out. The fact that it's not yet sundown makes me uneasy. But Lucius is clearly in distress. Even if he comes out early, he can stay in the shade. I hastily throw my hands along the side of the coffin lid and pull. It doesn't budge as if it's been nailed shut. I try to wrench it open from the opposite side, the coffin continues to hold fast as Lucius screams and trashes in its confines. The coffin rocks in place, its corners strike my torso and I maneuver around, knocking the air out of my lungs. Ah, Lucius, stop struggling! Please, why are you doing this to me? What have I done wrong? I'm trying to get you out, there's something wrong with this thing, is it jammed? I have done everything you asked. Everything I... I withdraw my hands with sharp recognition of this plight. Lucius isn't talking to me. Even his screams sound halfway coherent. Lucius, are you awake? He responds only with wrecked sobbing and a final weak thud. The source of the noise will not hurt you. He was so certain, so quick to assure me of my safety. I sighed through my nostrils, pressing my forehead against my lid. I'm here for you, alright? Even if you can't hear me. I slim fully against the coffin, sliding against it as my hand curls into fists. I'll be here as long as you need me. I'm here. Hours pass. I continue speaking to him softly, even when he seems to be addressing someone else, and I hold the coffin steady, straining my arms when, when it threatens to stumble onto one side. Sweat drips down my brow to my cheek, both from physical exhaustion and emotional toil. 
But I want to abandon him. He doesn't have anybody else. After an excruciating amount of time, he answers me with more noticeable coherence. His voice is gravely enhorsed and discreditably calmer compared to the earlier blow screaming. Abigail. Abigail. Are you still there? Yes. Hmm. The sun has gone down, hasn't it? Yes, at last. Lucius makes a small, curt noise of acknowledgement before he clears his throat. With a hollow wooden groan, the lid of the coffin begins to give away. Through the silver of an opening, I catch a glimpse of a torn, velvet bedding and deep gouges in the wood. The lid hangs aloft, barely ajar until Lucius' long fingers curl around the frame. He pushes it with visible effort, getting it just open enough to squeeze himself through. I scurry backwards to make room as Lucius staggers out, shoulders slumped and steps uneven. The coffin slam shuts behind him, a ghastly sight that reminds me too much of a closing mouth. Lucius raises his chin briefly, staring down at me with darting disbelieving eyes before he sags to the ground. I rush to his side, propping his, propping his back against the coffin. I'm sure it's the last thing he wants to touch, but it's near a solid surface. Lucius heaves a great, dejected sigh as head lolls back against the lid. Uh, it can't be opened until the sun is gone. Curses are obnoxious specific. Airtight. Much like the coffin itself. Though there are times I've woken up, spilled out of the damn thing because it rolled into one side. Although he is. Although he's panting and barely catching up his breath, he can't keep. He can't quite keep his absurd commentary to himself. I should thank you for keeping it steady tonight, I presume. You're ridiculous. You go through this every single night? Are you hurt? It feels like just yesterday when you were suggesting I had been amputated at the elbow and then miraculously healed me. <laughs> it feels like just yesterday when you were suggesting I had been amputated at the elbow and then miraculously healed from it with my mighty vampire powers. He chuckles himself as if recalling a fond memory and then he hangs his head between his knees. Without thinking twice, I reach out to rub white, slow circles on his back. An intrusive fraction of my mind notices his body is warmer than expected. Take your time. It bothers me that you're deflecting with humor, but we're a pair of pots and kettles, I suppose. Ah, uh, but the pot could have been capitalized on the opportunity to stab the kettle through the coffin. My hand's slow, resting on the shoulder blade. Is that a request? No, don't answer that. I wasn't going to. I didn't even occur to me, Lucius. If I wanted to stab you, I would have done it weeks ago. How many times have, have you been stabbed? Before you can answer me, I turn to look at the coffin with, with new eyes. An innumerable amount of thin, discolored lines streak across the surface, particularly around the head and the middle of the box. I thought they were wood veins at first. But as I lean closer and realize their incisions, splits that have since been filled with stained, some of them have the proximity width of a longsword. Lucius, this is absurdly horrific. This is no way for anyone to live. You don't deserve this. You're too kind, Abigail. A beat passes as he continues to breathe haggardly, still getting his bearings. Have you gotten any rest yourself? He doesn't look up at me. You might not have the strength to do so. Have you? Touché. But I was technically sleeping. Perhaps half asleep for some of it. But by and large, I wasn't conscious. I know. Hmm. Gradually his eyes rise to meet mine. How would you know such a thing? My breath catches when faced with our sudden proximity. I retract my arm from his back. 
though I, will, though I will myself to stay by side. It's just, we normally keep such a civilized distance from each other. I've never ever sat next to him until tonight. When I perform a songs for him, I'm, I'm the act and he's the audience. There's an invisible wall that separates us based on our different status. status the entertainer and the entertained. But here and now, I feel as though the wall has begun to crumble. You must think me a terrible housemate for screaming all day. No, no, not at all. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm tired. I bump my shoulder against this. My finger which and lays together in my lap. An apps mind that little distraction that provides me a small measure of comfort. I remember what it was like. I used to get night terrors when I was a girl. Did you know? At the orphanage, Nightingale Gardens. Yes, and it was the worst place to get night terrors. Half the matrons thought I was possessed. The other half thought I was being intentionally, maliciously disobedient. I can imagine. I was usually some recurring nightmare about rats too, which was the worst. I still get them sometimes. If you don't mind me asking, what do you dream about? Do you remember? I don't know. If I would call that a dream. It's more akin to, let's say, reliving a memory. The memory of when I first was exiled here. He taps the surface of the coffin with the back of his knuckles. My surrounding in there look roughly the same, no matter the time period. I'm sure it contributes to my confusion. I'm convinced that this... Lucius looks at me, his eyes full of meaning, that I can't, can't quite decipher. This is a dream, and the inside of the coffin is my reality. Is there anything I can do? Uh, can I get you something? Where do you keep your wine? I shift the stand, and Lucius catches my hand before fully upright. Stay, please. He blinks rapidly and then drops his gaze to the floor, as if he's uncertain and surprised at himself, but he does not let go. His hand around mine is gentle and apprehensive. Please, stay seated. Stay with me a little while longer. A quincing without difficulty, I lower myself into my knees. He seems to breathe more easily when I'm by his side. We stare out at the expensive glass window for a time, content to be quiet together. Of course, Lucius doesn't like to remain quiet for long. You know, I may feel better if you regale me with more miserable tales from your childhood. I wrinkle my nose at him and whack his shoulders with the back of my hand. He flinches, but I can feel his body quacking with quiet laughter. I'm serious. You mentioned something about rats. Why would they plague your dream so? I'm afraid of them. They seem to have taken a up unto themselves to haunt me, although this estate has been marvelously right free Yes, they'd have to try quite hard to cross the moat. Is there a story behind this fear of yours? Did you lose your parents to a drove of rats? I, I don't remember enough of my infancy to say either way. My earliest memories were in Nightingale Gardens, although there is this one time. I cut myself off with a snicker. Which makes Lucius tilt his head at me with a, with a wry, curious smile. A wordless request for me to finish my thought. Forgive me, it's it's just the stupidest thing. There was there was a time when food was going missing from the kitchen. The Martins gathered up and announced that we had a rat infestation. I was upset by this news, to say the least. I nearly stopped eating. Worried I'd find a hair or a whisker in my meal, or worse. Ugh, I shudder off for comical effect. When Lucius pets my hand, encouragingly, I shoot him a small, grateful smile. I was just so, I was so frightened whenever I, I saw those beady little eyes or that flick of a tail into a crevice. It haunted every moment of my little life, day and night. I'm fairly sure that that's when the nightmares began. I'd wake the whole orphanage just shrieking and apparently I'd even lash out at the Martins with swinging fists. But I wasn't awake, not really. I'd remember some of my outbursts, but I couldn't tell that was real. They talked about getting rid of me then. 
It was even more horror terrifying and confusing than the Nights of Terror. They discussed my fate right in front of me like I even wasn't there. Lucius doesn't say anything, he was... but he watches me with furrowed brows. Are you sure my miserable childhood tales are making you feel better, Lucius? No, but tell me anyway. What made your night terrors go away? Ah, that's a stupid part of the story. I didn't know Ophelia very well back then. I know she was a pitch perfect angel of Nightingale Gardens. And I know she was beautiful, but I was much too shy to speak to her. Until one day. She yanked me by the arm and pulled me aside. Dragged me all the way into the cellar, where we wouldn't be seen. Couldn't be overheard. Of course, this was very upsetting for me as well. Cellars, uh, cellars are notoriously full of rats. She hushed me fiercely, eyes ablaze, and she shook me so hard I nearly dizzy. Stop screaming every night, she said. There are no rats in the kitchen. I just sobbed and wailed in her arms. I didn't believe her, and I didn't like getting yelled at. I mean, how could she... She could try to lie me like that, right? It wasn't unreasonable for me to be afraid. I was just a little girl. God, she was so frustrated with me. She going through gittering thief and insisted there was absolutely no right, rats. And that's when she told me. She made it all up. The rats? The entire infestation. She made it up. She was lying to the entire orphanage about it. Why in heaven would she do such a thing? To see if she could get away with it. Isn't that awful? She was stealing extra helpings for food for herself and then plating false evidence, red drops and fur to ensure her lie held water. Each day she tell me the she tell the Martins that she was going to go into town to find a cat, you know? So the cat would eat rats, but she never actually looked for one. She just went out and had her fun in town. And came home with one of those apologetic duo do eyes that, that everyone made melt for her. So anyway, Ophelia showed me where she kept her spoils and she said she would share with me as long as I kept my mouth shut. I had to not to only stop screaming, but I also had to keep her grubby little secret. Her reputation was spotless after all, revealing her mischief would damage her chances of becoming the queen. I was offended at first, I suffered so many nightmares because of her, but then... Then I was intrigued. I promised I would keep quiet, but from that moment... On, I saw her as a new light. I watched her like a hawk and followed her like a shadow, curious what other lies she has been spreading. But the night terrors didn't stop, at least not right away. I guess Ophelia became fond of me at some point because she'd sneak into my room to sing softly to me every night, every single night, even when my nightmares were gone for good. I don't think I can forever, I, can, I don't think I can forget the lullaby. May I hear it, Abigail? That knot at the pit of my stomach returns, twisting and aching. No, I, I, I can't. From the corner of my eye, I notice a blotch of ink on my lap. I rip at it absentmindedly, smudging it with my thumb. I'm sorry. It, it's just. No need to explain. I, I understand. No, you don't understand. When I confronted her in the throne room, gods, I wasn't planning to be the treacherous, you know. I spent months writing a hand beautiful song for her, but when I saw her, I knew it was forbidden for the crown to see anyone from her previous life. I knew that, so I hid who I was. I used a false name and pretended it was my first time setting foot in on Olivian soil. All I wanted was to see her again. I would have been satisfied if I could see her one last time, if I could see all those terrible rumors were all wrong. My eyes sting. I wipe at them with my wrist. But she, whoever was sitting on the throne, it was not Ophelia, it couldn't have been her. Whoever it was, she had her face, but she didn't have her eyes, not the eyes I knew. His eyes were hungry yet full of disdain, watching me like was some sort of worm under her level. And she had this ridiculous harem that was dancing around, and every so often she'd call one of them to come sit on her lap and kiss it her in front of everyone. It didn't make sense. Ophelia didn't like anybody. I... Just to make sure, I started making small talk. Something to introduce the song. I asked if there were any rats in the royal kitchen. And she just scoffed at me. And told me it was a repulsive thing to, to suggest. She told me to be silent. 
that she didn't want to hear another word unless I was going to play a song. My lip quivered, and my voice began to break. So I changed the song. I had to convey how I truly felt. I... Lucius throws his arms around me, holding me tight. I bowl against his chest, losing every last ounce of my composure. Forgive me, forgive me, Abigail. I, I shouldn't have asked you about this. She told me she wanted to make things better for everyone. She told me she'd write. Why didn't she even write? Forgive me. Forgive me. Chapter 7, A Hesitant Tune This was a shorter chapter, but let's continue, I guess. Do I still have coffee left? I don't. I cried myself into a stupor. The next thing I knew was sitting on my bed with red, swollen eyelids and a throbbing headache. I have vague memories of Lucius carrying me to my room, grunting unhappily when he had to wedge his way in. I really needed to stop pushing my bed against the door. And then... As he drew the covers up my neck, he told me. What did he tell me? I tapped my temple in a steady rhythm, chasing down the memory before I elude from me good. What? Before it eludes from me for good. He wanted me to meet he wanted me to meet him in the courtyard. He said he wanted he said he would wait for me there until I felt well enough to see him. I think he said he had something to tell me. I pressed my palms into my eyes, hoping to reduce the swelling. Even my throat is raw, from shedding years of pent-up grief. In grief, place, a new flip-flop of emotions swell my chest, and my heart is pounding in erratic stacko beat. I think I'm going to be sick. I can't believe I told him everything. I even cried in front of him, slob slobbered all over his clothes. God, it was mortifying. I never cry in front of people, let alone on them. And I was so distracted by my own melodrama that I completely forgot to ask about... about that ring. I shake my head, telling myself that it's fine. I'll have plenty of time to ask him later. Lucius stands like a pillar under the moonlight. His hands are linked behind his back as he observes the heavens. For the first time in a long while, the sky is clear. A yellow crescent moon hangs high among the stars like a lopsided smile. I wince at the soggy squill of mud with every step I make. But since he was the one who asked me to meet here, I don't think he'll begrudge me for any muddy footprints. Hey, did I keep you waiting long? Lucius doesn't turn. I have something to show you. Ah, it was show, not tell. Is it another astrological phenomenon? No. His hands tighten impeccably behind his back. Lucius turns just enough to glance at me, and I shoot him a squeamishly puzzled grin in response. Something about seeing me renews his resolve. Follow me. Lucius leads me through the side entrance of the estate through empty stable and servant quarters. There was little of note when I ambled through there before. As we cut through the terrace, he stops and grabs a light and lantern. He holds it out in front of us. Though our path is far from dark, I continue to trail after him down several winding halls until finally reach dead end. Is this what you wanted to show me, Lucius? I've already seen every inch of this estate. What? Lucius pushes his palm against the for this wall, revealing a door-shaped indent. He leans his height, he leans his weight into it until it gives way, unveiling a dark passageway and a small staircase leading down. Lucius extends a hand to me with a sideways smile. Coming? I take his hand with a torch of hesitation. The skin is cool from the night air. I don't want to climb any more stairs after this. Lucius laughs and pulls me a step closer. You won't have to. I can promise you that. An ambitious promise. This is the moment where you were luring me. This is the moment where you're luring me into my doom at last, yes? You're finally going to drink my blood and reduce me to a withered corpse. 
Yes, I've prepared a wonderful marinade of citrus, olive oil and green pepper to, bas to baste you in downstairs. Really? No. It leads me down, the down an old cavernous path that expands in size the deeper we go in. The lantern sways from Lucia's grasp with each step, casting a pallid glow on the surrounding. I see now why he grabbed it. It soon becomes our only source of illumination. I squint when the light catches against the irregular surface. The side of this path have been piled with broken and non-essential objects, table legs, ripped cushions, and even some we weapons. That's the cabinet I broke on the first night here, isn't it? I was wondering where it went. And are those wine barrels? Yes and yes. I see the underground as a storage room. So this is where you're hiding all your letters and buckets and wine? Hiding? Not at all. I just like to keep things tidy. Although... His hand tightens around mine. I do try to withhold the letter from my guests at the beginning of their stay. The number of people who have tried to brave the moat and drowned in that attempt... I, um... I didn't want the same thing to happen to you. Because you would have missed my music? I would have missed you. I wouldn't have been able to help you, Abigail. His voice is stern, with a harder edge than I expected. If something happened to you in the moat, if you were to... Unable to breathe water, as I am, I would only have been able to watch. I do not want to see you suffer. The sheer weight behind his words make me hold my tongue. Despite the temptation to make a flip flant comment about my inability to swim. The ground begins to shift from solid rock to loosely packed dirt that turns and scuffs underfoot. Soon the path slopes and the air becomes heavy and damp. I find myself taking deeper breaths, which only magnificent my growing apprehension. Lucius lets go of my hand as we reach a steep precip precipice. My fingers scroll inward already aching from the absence of his touch. Lucius, where are you taking me? What is this place? Nailed into the precipice with wood stakes, a long rope ladder extends further into the dark abyss. The opening becomes narrow below, but the structure of the passage seems secure and dry, no signs of water droplets leaking through from the moat. I catch Lucius trying to hide the grimace when he kneels to inspect the strength of the rope. Deep beneath the earth as we are, we must be standing in the lowest part of the estate. Being this far from the coffin must be straining for him. When Queen Hildegard banished me, when she sealed me in that blasted coffin, she ordered the soldiers to put me somewhere around here. Originally, this was an enclosed wine cellar attached to the estate where my exile began, and when I first woke, we removed the wine, of course, before we began the excavation. Excavation? I told you before that I had a motley crew working on a way out. There were five of them, including Gillian. They dug for months under my supervision. You can see why I had to relocate to sleep upstairs, I'm sure. Where are you going with this? Isn't it obvious? I'm setting you free, Abigail. This tunnel will lead you safely, under the moat and out to the other side. I must have misheard him. I'm sure of it. That's the only reasonable explanation. He must have said something like, Go fetch me some tunnel fish, or I'm trapping you down here forever so you can never cry one on me again, you disgusting creature. You look as though... You wish to argue with me? I understand the verbal sparring is one of our favorite pastimes, but please, listen to me this once. Every day you spend here is a lost opportunity, Abigail. This time you will never get back. Why should you endure such a fate when you didn't do anything wrong? You do not deserve to be punished just for speaking your mind. All this over a mere song. You understand, don't you, Abigail? Your freedom should never have been up for bargain. Your freedom 
Yours is priceless, Abigail. Lucius, wait. This is so sudden. I can wait no longer knowing the injustice you've suffered. Please, Abigail. Live your life and be free. You're not an immortal like me. You should spend with a little time you have in happiness. But haven't you also suffered injustice, Lucius? Don't you also deserve freedom and happiness? I cast my eyes down the dark passage by searching. If this leads in the remote, you should be able to travel beneath it, right? He no longer tries to hide that flinching grimace, that cold reminder of his reality, the coffin, the secondary measure that guarantees he can never leave. Can't... Can't you bring the coffin with you? As long as it's nearby, can't you go anywhere you want? And what? Carry it all over? Carry it all the way through miles of tunnels and wood? Stopping each day to clamber in and howl through the night terrors? Terrifying the local wildlife? That eventually... When we do reach civilization, you'll gain a name as the woman who travels with a possessed coffin. We'll both be social parias. Parias then? No, won't we? No, thank you. Besides, I believe I told you how I deeply dislike tight spaces. The tunnels beyond this point disagree with me. I'm better off here, in my own private estate. How can you believe this is better? It is the only choice I have, Abigail. It is the only life I am allowed to lead. You'd best be worried about your own choices, especially now that your debt is cleared. I provide you with a week worth of rations, along with enough coin from my personal coffers to compensate you for your performance. Now, are you ready to go? Ridiculously, my eyes are swimming with tears again, despite my best attempt to blink them back and wipe them away. What will I choose? Well, the choice for me is obvious. I'm even having a small tear here and there, getting very emotional at this. But, um... Just technically speaking, she can always go wander around and come back. There is a tunnel. Why should she leave? She, she can go around for a day or two a week, come back. You don't have to leave forever. You can, you can always go away to a village, perform a month or two, three, come back, live a couple of months. It's okay. I won't leave you. You can maybe go, Lucius. I refuse to abandon you. Abigail, please. You must see reason. I have explained why I cannot go with you. Then I'm staying here. I don't intend to leave your side, Lucius. Not now. Not not ever. Lucius recalls from me as though he suffered a physical blow. How could you say such a thing? You have no future here. Yes, I do have a future. It's not as if I'm going to drop dead on a spot after deciding to stay. See? I still draw breath. That's not what I mean, and you know it. You know as well as I do, there is little to do and the food is lacking. On top of that, every two years... I risk dying at the hands of a hypo hypothetical brigand. Lucius, it's no different from the world outside. The roads were dangerous even when I traveled from an entire caravan. I've also been forced to take lives in order to defend myself. By the way, so don't you even try to bellyache your being too monstrous to associate with me. I wasn't going to... Let me finish. I held up my chin and meet his gaze dead on. Much like when I perform in front of the Queen's Court. You told me before that you would respect my right to choose. I dearly hope that has not changed. I know that your arrangement began from the place of punishment and debt. But as I spent time here and I got to know you, I began to feel differently about my, about my situation. You're right that my time is precious. I intend to spend it in a place that was brought me the most joy I've ever felt. I don't care about food or amenities, Lucius. I'll eat your disgusting fish every single day, if that's what it takes to be with you. To... Who, well, to be with me? I clasp my hand over my mouth. My words... My own words sink in... In fear as Lucius echoes them. And I realize with mild frustration that they were true to the core. Nothing is more important than being here from him. Somewhere beneath the surface, I've always known that my putting feelings for Lucius amounts to more than mere loneliness. Convinced myself that I was fine with being 
a compassionless traveling part, yet now it hurts to be away from him when the sun rises. How much deeper would the knife cut if I leave him now? I've seldom been in love, I'm, I'm not confined, I recognized, even if it slapped me across the face. But this feeling I have when I look at him now, it's... God, I hate how honest I've... I've had to be now, I'm, I'm, I'm in close, frequent proximity to someone I actually like. My voice shakes, though I try my best to get my bearings. I've... I've come to care about you a great deal, Lucius, can't you tell? We all lived in a cold, wicked world. You know as well as I do that sending me back there would not guarantee my safety. These bandits and white elements, shipwrecks and desert heat. I'm grateful that I survived my fair share and adversity just long enough to meet someone like you. Being here is the closest I've felt like having a home. I don't even have much of a life to return to outside this estate. Maybe I want to rot here for the remainder of my brief and miserable existence? I want to discover what else we have in common, and, and I want to learn more about you. What would you, would you deprive me of that? This is, um... Conflicting emotions, Wara grows his feature. I can tell he's tempted to give in, but... He just... He has a strongly compelling to battle this to the bitter end. This... Is precisely the part of the problem. You don't even know who I was before. A member of the royal family. I found your ring, Lucius. I was shocked at first, but you weren't the one who co commanded me here. What? You weren't. You weren't the one who commanded me here. Aha. Uh -huh. I won't hold you accountable for the cruelty of your successors. So please don't suggest that I'd hate you because of who you are. I don't. I suspected that you'd found it, but you still don't understand. Then explain to me. Are you not royalty after all? These tunnels will be the death of me. I feel lightheaded. I need some air. Lucius turns and stalks away, leaving me with the lanterns. Lucius! There's no sense of déjà vu as I pursue him through the servant quarters, my pace far less hurried than his. Although his strides are long, I have no difficulty keeping up. He slows to a stop in the courtyard, and once more stands with his back turned to me. Do you know how difficult it was to make the decision to free you? A selfish, disgusting part of me is pleased that you would choose to stay. It's not selfish to be pleased, Lucius. Isn't it? He rules on me. I told you what happened last time to Jillian. It took me years to recover. If any harm were to befall you, if you would be taken from me, I don't think I could... He cuts himself up as if a shuddering breath escapes him. Lucius, I'm making this decision not from a place of foolhardy courage but because your presence is worth enduring some apprehension. I am scared, you know. It's alright if you're scared too. I close the distance, reaching for him. When it mirrors my movement, however, timely, I seize him and pull him into a fierce hug. Lucius trembles in my grasp, his fingers dingly small crevices into my clothes on my back. I can't promise I'll live forever, Lucius. No one can promise it. Not even you. But the time I've spent with you has been the happiest times I've ever known. I feel like I can talk to you about anything, even things I'd intended to bury forever. And the memories I've made here, I know to appreciate them only because I've had you by my side. Please don't deprive me of our bond. I want to enjoy it while it lasts, however long that may be. Lucius. I think I'm falling in love with you. <laughs> My heart feels like it's stopped. I know it sounds absurd. I know we haven't known each other long. But you're a beautiful, radiant woman. Anyone can see it. You must have better options than this. You deserve other options. I just know someone out there will worship the very ground you walk on. This confession reverberates in my mind like a turning fork. 
I feel dizzy and like I'm soaring all at once. But the plumes have to get enough to murmur into his hair. What if I don't want other options? What if I only want you? Then I would be powerless to deny you my radiance. Oh, that's so romantic, my radiance. I'm going to write that down. That's a beautiful world. My radiance. What does that even mean? Radiance. Oh my god, that's a beautiful world to call a lady. I would simply... I would hate for you to regret this decision. I pull away. Not to detach from him, but to get a good look at his face. His eyes search mine as he gives his palm over his cheek. I propose a new barter, vampire. Oh? I would have your heart, in exchange for mine. Despite himself, Lucius scoffs out a small laugh. If you have thought this through, if you are truly, wholeheartedly certain... Then to rot we shall together. It takes flyaway strand of hair over my ear. Such a tender gesture from someone I once feared so deeply. Can I kiss you? Take initiative and kiss him first? You may. No, it's her personality to go in first! I parch leap into him, crushing my lips against his and knocking our teeth together. <laughs> he makes a surprising sound. And he doesn't protest. Lucius encircles his arm around my wrist, waist, and leans in, kissing me harder. Mutual laughter bubbles between us, and I kiss him all over his ridiculous face. Abigail, you. He scoffs out another laugh, looking as bashful as a schoolboy. He cradles my face in his hands and plants a final chesty kiss on my forehead. I'm the luckiest man in the land. I love you, Abigail. How long I have. Loved you. Ooh, oh. And then he kisses me again, pulling me closer in the midnight sky. The world feels so suddenly weightless. I recede to come up for air and... But Lucius pulls me back in. I recede to come up for air, but Lucius kiss, pulls me back in, kissing me with the force of a crashing wave. So I breathe him in, along with the crisp, earthy scent of moist oil. The night of... The night air normally has a cold bite that sticks to my skin like molasses. When he holds me in his arms, I feel like velvet. Lucius presses his forward against mine with a breathless chuckle, smiling so hard that I barely recognize him. In my... Uh, in my... Uh, in all my long years, I have never met anyone like you. And in my comp... Terribly very short years. I have never had i I've never fallen fallen for a vampiric clean freak with the driest sense of humor I ever know. Clean freak? Oh fine, you're not wrong, I still love you, you insolent creature. Lucius catches me around the waist and lifts me, spinning us into a triumphant half arc. Lucius Don't tell me contain myself, Abigail. I won't do it after all the riches of the world. Blistering foxtails skim over my ankles, and, I f and my feet fall uneven as he sets me down. Before I can regain my balance, Lucius claps my hand in his own and begins stepping in time to the melody only he can hear. What are we doing? We're dancing as lovers do. I stumble as he guides our bodies into a revolving turn. Oh, oh I don't know how to dance, Lucius. I've been tapping my feet along to my own melodies at most. He maneuvers me under his arm and pulls me close enough to kiss my knuckles in a fluid motion. Then it's a good thing you'll have all the time in the world to learn. Sedates buzz all around us like a steady hum of applause. In addition, the single Oxford begins the chorus of its song. Another joins in and another until the moat itself seems to hum with their reverie. The very, st the very star feels like they're sweeping around as in a Big will dance, embracing us in the wind-blown curtains at night. As Lucius dips me back, I realize there aren't stars at all when one of them lands on my nose. Are these lunar flies? There's so many. Lucius, I think these are bugs that stung me when I first crossed them out. Hmm? Oh god, then we need to get inside. We rush into the state together, holding on to each other and giggling like children. 
Lucius slows only to pet me down and make sure none of the insects tag along. Nasty little bastards. The worst sting will age for days. I forgot how aggressively lunar flies breed during the rainy season. My cheeks hurt from grinning as he tends to me, diligently checking my hair and under my arms. Lucius. Yes, my radiance. I nearly burst out in laughter at the pet name he's chosen, <laughs> but I regain enough to control to pass it for <laughs> off as clearing my throat. I give him a quick peck on the cheek, redirecting his attention from checking for bugs into looking into my eyes. His lips stilt into a smirk as he begins to gently against as he backs me gently against the wall, pinning me in place and propping his elbow elbow next to next to my head. You keep me in suspense, Abigail, what is it? Oh I You've made it difficult to speak my mind. I enjoy challenging you. Right. Okay, look. Before we go any further, I think there are a few more things we should discuss. Hmm? Lucius dips his head down and begins to kiss my neck. Lucius! <laughs> no, I don't actually agree with you. We should set some uh, expectations. He pulls away only slightly. I make a show of mercy. For example... He traces a line from my neck to my collarbone, sending a needy shiver down my spine. How do you feel about biting? Particularly the kind that would turn you into a creature of the night. Uh... Despite Lucius' easy demeanor, I know this isn't a decision I should make lightly. Turning into a vampire would be tr a tremendous change. Is it worth it? In exchange for the promise of forever? Oh, I'm very in interested. Agree to become a vampire. Biting would be hot. <laughs> Although, I don't want to remain human. Please don't bite me. I want to go... Ah, clicking the vampire part. I'm very interested. There's an indisputable appeal to immortality and power. Along with the chance to share an eternity with my new beloved. Actually, only pulled it just because out of mercy, I would say. Imagine how... If you live for three, four, five, six hundred years, you fall in love, you lose, you fall in love, you lose, you fall in love, you become, you become really a husk. Lucia's expression of absolute enthrallment only serves to bolster my decision. Then, when a twilight eve of your choosing it shall be done, your wish will be my command whenever you are ready. The process may be painful at first, but I am certain you will emerge from it more radiant and more powerful than ever. Now, what was it you wished to discuss with me before we consummate our relationship? Oh, I mean, it, it, it's a little bit embarrassing, you're going to laugh at me? Is laughing such a bad thing? Uh, I was wondering if you were the first Deluvian king. The one who surrendered his crown to the heavens. His bellowing laughter reverberates against the very wall. I know you'd laugh at me, oh you jerk! Forgive me, forgive me, it's just... Abigail, you may need to relearn your history. Illuvian's first king reigned from the dawn of civilizations. If I were him, I would be very old indeed. My father's side of the family did claim to be descendant from the man, but birth certifies can only be easily forged these days. I myself am no king. I was the higher for a time, but never ascended the throne. Which means you. Which means you were a prince. I still am, if it pleases you. Lucius tilts his head, studying me as if a thought has just occurred to him. You know, Abigail, you just said once that I had no whimsical books of this estate. But I do have one on the subject of old myths around here somewhere. I should see about finding it. Are you familiar with the story of... Hesiod's Jar? I think so. It's a box instead of a jar in some iterations, isn't it? The story involves someone opening a container, despite being warned not to touch it. And in doing so, they released all manner of curse upon mankind. You truly do know your stories. He caresses my cheeks absent-mindedly. 
It's a tale that uh, resonated with me for quite some time. I had a personal theory that there was some two kinds of people in the world. The kind who refer to live a blissful, inobtrusive existence who would never risk those curses. And the ones curious enough to open the box, even knowing the consequences that will befall them. I'm fairly certain of that answer. But, Abigail, what manner of person do you think you are? Ad, Abigail is definitely the curious, even if it hurts at first. Definitely. I'd rather be curious, even if it hurts at first. You know me, don't you, Lucius? I have to see what's at the bottom of the jar. If I recall, despite its moral lessons of caution, the story has an optimistic ending. In the wake of the curse they unleashed, the main character peered just once more into the container. They discovered that hope remained. Though the release curses were irreversible, hope would temper their effects. The true moral of the story is, although some curiosities can be cursed, more curiosity may be the cure. So give this choice. I have to open the jar. I would dig, I would rifle and root, and I would untangle every web I would find until I see the things that they truly are. You would prefer to be... Curious rather than content. I think I cannot be content if I were forced to temper my curiosity. I see. I should have expected no less from a woman like you. Your relen relentless nature is one I've come to admire. This coming from a vampire with an inhuman sense of restraint. I should be flattered. I nudge him, half expressing, half expecting him to laugh and tease me. Tease that he just... Tease that he may just let his restraint slip tonight. But Lucius looks surprisingly con contemplative. Lucius, is something the matter? I reach up to touch his face, feeling his jaw work under my finger. He turns just enough to sight warmly into my palm. I don't remember the last time I felt such harrowing happiness. I worry this blissful rapture of yours will be short-lived. Need we worry about such things so soon? He kisses my hand, soft and reverent. I prefer to chart out my worries sooner rather than later, Abigail. There is something I else wish to share with you, much like I have never told about Gillian. This is a thought I would never voice aloud. I believe you are the only one who will understand, who will help me understand. My eyelashes flutter with wonders. It's no surprise that Sergei's old vampire has accumulated enough trouble to plague his thought. Though I am a bit... Ex... Exasperated at the timing. Why bring this up now, when I'm pinned in an intimate position against the wall? I'm eager to be helpful. Uh, what, what's on your mind? Not here. I need to find something. Will you have a seat and wait for me? Of course. Lucius exhales sharply through his nose, relief and gratitude all at once, and presses his lips to my cheek. A smart and modest fire in the heart, in the hearth, 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 as I wait for him, prodding my branches into position with the ever trusty fire iron. Once I'm done, I set the fire iron against the mantle where it belongs. I don't need it anymore. I recall the collection of weapons Lucius has stowed away in the underground. I wonder if it, if he can train me to wield one. Though I no longer need to safeguard myself against him, the unwanted guest will safely, will surely have me singing in a different tune. When Lucius returns to my side, he's holding a flat frame of wood face down against his chest, and wearing such a somber expression that I suspect he brought me a mourning portrait. The frame is moderately sized, with a width that equals his shoulder and a height spanning from his collarbone to his navel. The wood is the same shade of black tone as his coffin, which is, which in itself makes me uneasy. Abigail, thank you for waiting. His eyes trail past me to stare at a massive ink stain at the center of the room. In a whirlwind of our 
unanticipated romance. I had completely forgotten to clean it up. Um, what did you do to my desk? Forgive me? I was looking for the rag to clean it, but then I heard you screaming and, well, they both got a little distracted after that, I think. A rag? You were looking for a rag? Abigail, you spilled a tidal wave of ink on my desk and floor. No rag will ever be enough to clean it up. Yes, I suppose we'd want to use some line soap to lift the stain. If we don't have any, it's... say, why don't I use the tunnel to procure some supplies from the nearest town? Well, I'm at it. I can even barter for a new instrument to entertain you with. New books for us to read. Lucius steers his attention away from the desk with visible effort. The desk is mm, not that important. It's clear, it clearly is important, Lucius. I'm truly sorry, and I want to make it up with you. He gives his shoulder an ineffectual squeeze. You are good to me. You know, it never occurred to me that a guest can come and go freely using the tunnels. No one ever has used it to come back. Well, then it's a good thing I'm here to think out loud for you. I coax Lucius to sit on his usual velvet chairs. I see slumps down beside me, firelight dance over the planes of his face. What did you want to share with me? Lucius sighs. He runs his hand over his scalp, breaking eye contact. I haven't been able to stop thinking about the events that led to my exile. For so long I believe it was all unjust that I was suffering an unfair fate, but since you found a scrap of parchment, no, ever since I met you, you've encouraged me to reflect on myself, Abigail, and I'm no longer certain of my innocence. Funny that you should mention innocence. I've recently begun questioning the very concept. Good thing I don't always come to virtuous people, just as evil doesn't always get punished. When the world itself is unjust, one sense of injustice, of one sense of innocence, is not enough to guarantee their safety or freedom. God, I just, just look at what happened to Gillian, murdered in cold blood for trusting in the goodness of a fellow man. We are not pure, faultless thing, Lucius. We are, when we are placed in a position of suffering, we often need to become worse to survive. It is not strange to become blemished when we fall. You said it yourself that no one is perfect. I know. I knew you might say this. Which is why I need you to see what I've brought. I put the pieces of the portrait I put the piece of the portrait back together. Its edge are frayed and some parts are still missing, but he turns the frame face up. Oh I feel myself turn pale as the eyes of the perfect meet my own. Is that... Is that the friend? Is that Ophelia? The depicted woman looks as if she made... As if, as if she's made from ivory and rose leaves. Her arresting and imprevious beauty, her very essence, is masterfully captured in sweeping line of shark on ink. All too well, I know this. Regularly arched brows and downed, slender shoulders. How could I ever forget? Ophelia? What? Why do you have a portrait of Ophelia? This portrait depicts Queen Hildegard Edge Heaven, the ruling crown from more than three centuries past. She was. Lucius drops his gaze on the floor. She is my mother. Your mother? He told me I was a prince, but... Oh god, Lucius! You were exiled by your own mother? Exiled and cursed at that. Do you need to sit down? I'm already sitting down, we both are. What? Why does your mother look so much like Ophelia? They can't be related by blood, can't they? I studied the feature of the portrait more closely. Like sisters, they share an eerie resemblance. The same full lips, the same apple curve of the cheekbone, the same pert pointed nose, but slowly I noticed several differences. Ophelia loved to smile, even when she was simpering or sly. She had a lively sense of joy and was contagious to everyone around her. The queen in the sport with his icy, judging stare 
and seems to reverse roles with her viewing as she calculates where, she, where to place them. Her head is tilted to a faint angle and something about her dark eyes look half dead. While I doubt Ophelia is related to Queen Hildegard, I also doubt the resemblance is mere coincidence. In fact, I suspect every single queen over the past three centuries bears a resemblance to the woman on this portrait. Isn't it strange, Abigail, that we've had an unbroken line of cruel, corrupt crown who do little to better to live the lives of the people, even when they previously expressed an interest in breaking tradition? Surely they cannot all be so weak-willed, they would bend to the demand of their court and the status quo. Isn't it strange that they are not allowed to be depicted in portraits or seen in public? That they are not even allowed to stay in touch with anyone they knew prior to the re regency? Almost as if the very fact of sitting on the throne compels them to behave in an ominous way. Or perhaps the person on the throne never changes. What are you saying? I admit, I am not sure how to even start explaining my rational. Start from the beginning, please. I am... Um, I'll try. As you are aware, I've been unable to set foot outside this estate since the moment of my exile. This means I never had any chance of encountering your Ophelia, but I can tell you what I know about Queen Hildegard. Abigail, how widespread is this practice of sorcery in the world outside? Sorcery? I had little personal experience with it, but I don't think it's prevalent. There are small sects of wizardry and alchemy in certain kingdoms, but some royal families keep court magicians, that's all I know. Lucius nods. It was even less prevalent when I was a mortal man. Magic was an elusive art form that even were equipped to per pursue. Yet my mother, I was told she began practicing sorcery as soon as I was born. She had severe complications when she was heavy with a child and nearly did not survive. Very close to death changed her and terrified her more than anything. I always wondered if that the reason behind the cold demeanor she'd have towards me, that she harbored the grudge because my very existence nearly killed her once. She barely deigned to speak to me and was quick to hand off to servants. My father, the king at the time, assured me that she simply needed to warm up being a mother. I knew I was wrong when she adopted and towed it over two young girls. As king and queen, my parents were under an extraordinary amount of pressure to produce continual heirs. Since the idea of giving birth upset my mother so deeply, they adopted Mathilda and Artemisia in secret to appease their court. The girls resembled them enough to pass as real children. You did tell me you had sisters? Yes, I used to call them my mother's little pets and secretly envy them. They inherited the throne after Queen Hildegard reigns, didn't they, Abigail? Uh, tell me more about your mother. Ah, her contempt for me was more noticeable than Mathilda and Armantisha running amok. She was so protective of them, never allowed them to set foot beyond the palace gates, never allowed them to be seen by outsiders. I became prone to the debauchery for a while, drinking to excess, streaking through the hedges and sleeping with handmaidens who were far too old for me. But all these calls for attention were duly ignored, aside from an occasional slap on the wrist from my father. It never hurt. He was thin, reedy man, and so easily influenced to submit to the will of others. Easily influenced? You sound like you dislike him, Lucius. No, I should never resent him. Though I found him difficult to respect him. If he were not the ruler of a nation, much such weakness and inertia may have been a charming. You are growing up to be very different from them then. I hope so. He was far from an aspirational figure in my mind. Now, um, where was I? You were talking about being being prone to debauchery, sorry. That's right, debauchery. That phase didn't last long. When I realized I'd continue to be bereft of the attention I desire, all I left to do was focus on my studies. As heir, there was much to keep me occupied. It was on my 20th birthday that one of the Queen's Hildegard spells went awry. She buried an entire wing of the palace in noxious mist, 
Anyone who breathed it in excess withered into bone dry corpse, as if all the moist have been drained from the flesh. Several members of a staff died where they stood, and several more had lifelong complaints, difficulty breathing, periodic convulsions, and an eternal itch of skin. Oh god, were you alright? Lucia scoffs out in a small chuckle. It's kind of you to ask, but I was nowhere near the wing. My celebrations took place in a great hall. I felt the tremor of the spell impact even there. Matilda was fine as well because she was snuck down to see me. But Queen Hildegard and Amartisha suffered from after, after effects of the spell. Amartisha had, had to have her hand amputated. Oh god, and your mother? Queen Hildegard was bedridden for a long time. My father grew enough of a backbone to forbid to use magic within the castle walls, and news of his decision devastated her. Back then I had no idea what she was trying to accomplish. She never spoke to me after all, though I noticed she accumulated a collection of tomes and talismans. I had just begun shifting through her materials, trying to make sense of what was happening when she called for me. Not for my sisters, not for my father, but for me. Lucius exhales a sharky breath, and I give his knee a gentle squeeze. Forgive me. This is a difficult part of my past to relive. This, this is when thing went irrevocably wrong. I should never have agreed to see her. I should have. I should have shown her the same scorn I've always shown me. She was your mother, Lucius. Even she done something horrifying. I understand why you went to her. Still, it, it's a difficult subject for you. No. I need you to know the role I played in this sordid affair, Abigail. How complicit I was in it. Lucius' eyes are wrecked with such a deep despair, trepidating that I find myself gripping and a cushion for support. Complicit? All those years ago? What could we possibly have done that would have such a profound effect on him? In that case, I'm listening. I'm not sure how this is linking to Ophelia, or if Lucius even intends to redirect the conversation to my old friend, but the fact that Queen Hildegard adopted two girls who resembled her, something about the detail tugs at me. Like the snag of a fish hook in my mind. My sisters. Oh, how they sobbed at my mother's door, begging for entry. It was just Matilda at first, but Ar Artemisia joined her the minute she, dis she recovered from the amputation. My mother refused to see them, shunned them with the same coldness I knew so well. I thought I would feel satisfied when I pushed past them in the chambers. She had finally refused them and chosen me. It was like I'd won something. With those wailing little faces, shiny and stained with snot and tears. There was no satisfaction to be had, I felt sorry for them. They were eager to, they were eager to idolize her. Yes, heartbreakingly so. My mother's bed was the size of a ship. And she was propped up in the center on a snow drift of pillows. I remember looking away from him, pliant and observing her through the full-length mirror embedded in the wall. Her reflection looked, well, bright-eyed and pink-skinned, better than I'd seen her in recent memory. Though her movements were sluggish as she beckoned to me with wide arms and browy smile. Then she held me close and coated over my weight, over my hate, height. I felt more like being in an embrace of a distant aunt than a mother, but I cherished that thin guise of matronly affection anyway. I tried to look impassively as she confined in me. She talked at length about her deep-seated fear of death and her lonely toil of trying to overcome it. She dug under the pillow and produced a book, a hideous thing that made my skin crawl. The covers look a little too much like she's so haphazardly using scraps of human flesh. She refuses to let me take a closer look, but she haltingly informed me that she'd traded part of her soul to create it. 
was an infernal grimoire. My mother, the queen, had become a full-blooded witch straight out of the fairy tale. She told me that the mist was a horrendous accident, that she'd only intended to curdle her own bodily functioning as a mean to achieve immortality. Apparently the spell disrupted when her Artem Artemisia wandered in at an inopportune time, causing the eruption of the mist in the wing. Though the power of the Grimoire was great, she knew that when it was too dangerous and difficult to control, she said that she needed to look into another options. Lucius laughs rarefully. I, um, I convinced myself I had no reason to doubt her, my own mother. Even then her explanation had no sense, but I summarized that the half curled body was a reasonable cause for her bedridden state. She then asked me to assist her in overcoming the affliction of death. She said she could trust no one else, and that she could she would be glad to share eternity with me once we had discovered its secrets. What manner of son would I be if I said no? After she finally worked up the courage to bear the contents of her heart after all this time. That odd sequence of words click into place in my head. The words he screamed from the confines of his coffin. You did everything she asked? I did. I leaped at the chance to become her research assistant, her little pet. I lost sleep studying ancient tomes day and night. I used every resource available to me, organiz organizing expeditions, hiring treasure hunters and informants, all to come through the farthest corners of the earth for the merest sign of eternal life. Queen Hildegard did a part in research, but her work had to be discreet. We began spending much time, much of our time here because she was forbidden to practicing sorcery in the main palace. Lucius winged his arms in a slow arc to indicate our surroundings. Our summer estate. She used to call it our mother and son getaway, as if it were vacation. I stare at him, and then I see the gla and then I see the chamber in a different light as I follow the gesture of his arm. It's strange to imagine the estate as anything other than my new home. I try to picture Lucius and a woman in the portrait working late and into the night, burning kettles down to wax puddles. Part of me is anxious to skip to the story's end, knowing Lucius' fate all too well. However, a much larger part of me needs to hear how it happened. I need to know what led Lucius to become a vampire, exiled and alone in his own estate. One day at last, the efforts bear fruit. A wise and collector of curiosities sold me frank fragments of an ancient ritual, and she claimed it was one of the oldest forms of immortality. Although the full, precise method was lost, they were now graced with some of its steps. It was remarkable timing too. My resources were depleting fast, and the court asking questions that were becoming difficult to assume as each. By the point my mother had become more proficient in witchcraft, though she mainly used it to keep her youth from fading, we were able to use her practical knowledge and my investigation finding to reconstruct the ritual. Picking up on some basic of magic meanwhile, not enough to construct original spells the way she did, but enough to understand how hers work. I still, it still took years to trial, it still took years of trial and error, my father and his court continued asking their questions, but it was easier to appease them when I stopped draining the royal coffers. I remember Queen Hildegard being relieved by this. She always insisted she could not be linked to our work. I understood her concern. My father had such an unfavorable stance toward her interest in magic. And I certainly did not wish to see strife in my parents' union. I was fine with lying on her behalf. When we were ready to undergo the ritual, my mother bade me to go first. I was so healthy and young compared to her, a frail and anxious old woman. I wish I could say I hesitated to obey her. Everything she asked. The echo of words were sounding less like Buzit Loctus and more like Death, death Knell. 
I thought it was a success. My old scars healed over an instant, my visions improved and I dare say I looked a bit easier in my eyes. Yet, it wasn't long before we noticed side effects. We had discovered one of these oldest forms of immortality alright, and the costs would make themselves known. My teeth, my fingers were evidently sharper. I could no longer step into broad daylight or enter homes uninvented, uninvited, and my reflection was simply gone. I like this mind I like the mindless bloodless that typically accompanies my condition, but no longer being human was a wholly unexpected cor corollary of this ritual. We had recreated the dark gift in its purest form, Abigail. The process that allowed the first vampire to roam the eternal darkness. However, in exchange, I had lost my privilege of walking among mortal men. Queen Hildegard was dissatisfied with the results of my transformation. Despite gaining the power and immortality she craved in her eyes, I was a failed experiment. He leaves a pained, bitter pause. She was cold to me again and hated it. I knew I disappointed her, I would have given anything to regain her affection. The infernal grimoire. She liked to keep it close, but she couldn't be seen carrying such a ghoulish looking thing. Once she was forced to leave it unattended, I seized the opportunity to lead through its pages. I thought I could still find it useful. I knew she'd be looking into the ritual, other rituals, other methods of immortality. But the horrors I found in that wretched book, gods. The way she was planning to use all the materials and ingredients I'd gathered, it sent me into a panic. She was going to take it too far. I wanted to dis dissuade her, to reason with her, but she was incensed when she learned I touched the grimoire. She punished me. She gathered my most favorable attendants, and she had them all slaughtered. Everyone who knew about my condition, everyone who would speak out of my behalf, they were all put to death. And then she made me take the fall. My mother dumped the bodies in a wine cellar and bound me into the coffin amidst them. I understand it. She said I'd kill them. I went into call me a monster without a shred of remaining humanity, claiming she saved the kingdom from a reign of terrors. I don't know what she else told my father or what they specifically said to the court. When I emerged from the coffin I was alone in this estate and surrounded by the corpses of people I held dear. And I drank from them. There was no saving them, but I feel disgusted with myself even now. Lucius had turned from me, so I could only see the silhouette glow of firelight on the concord of his cheek. I felt stranded, struck processing the grieving enormity of his origin. The room seemed dimmer and colder as its minutes tick on. I don't know what, what it's like to have a mother, but I know what it's like to crave someone's approval. I can't say whatever or not I would have made the same decision as Lucius, but being born by Queen Hildegard undeniably set in on a narrow tra 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 trajectory. How can I possibly condemn him for that? There was nothing else you could have done, Lucius. Wasn't there? You blame yourself too severely. Your mother, Queen Hildegard. She led me into the darkness, yes. She took me and delved deep into the dark arts. Dark arts. But I bowed my head and I followed. She would not hold such power now if I dared to defy her even once. She? What do you mean now? Lucius glances at me before scrolling at the fire his hands open and close in an uneasy rhythm around the picture frame. Lucius, tell me! Help me understand! Do you know how my parents died? Every orphan in Nightingale Gardens can recite the names and prominent facts of the royal family. Before I ran away, the Martins managed to drill the knowledge into my skull throughout stringent repetition and occasionally via whippering switch across the palms. I haven't thought about Illuvian's history in a long time, but I can recall it's as easy as my fondled memories. His Majesty King Frederick Edgehaven died of an illness, his queen never remarried and died of old age. Died of old age, isn't that odd? Do you think such obsession with immortality can simply wither away over time? 
because she found another way to live, Abigail. I know it's for effect. The spells she composed in a grimoire were horrific, compelling servitude, summoning demons, hexes, plagues, and of course, consuming the life essence of another person. So, so she lives on without whispering nefariously plots into the crown's ears like some evil visor? I'm telling you that she sits on the throne still, Abigail. This spell, when concentrated on a single victim, it takes everything from them. It steals their energy, their youth, and even their face. Everything until the victim shivers and collapses lifeless, leaving only a thief with her new body. Memories rush back in a flash. My performance before the Queen's Court. I felt the bile rising in the back of my throat. No! I didn't know it then, but I know now. Queen Hildegard meant to cast it on my sister, and misfire due to the immensity of the Grimmar's power. It scarred her then, and made her back off, made her call towards her daughters. Only then did she seek the alternative meadow through me, but oh, I'm certain she kept that consuming spell in mind all the while. Perhaps poor Armitisha wasn't a suitable vessel. Even after the second attempt, after years of my exile, Quill Herdegard would have to move into a spare body, Matilda. But once Matilda wasn't spent, she went... She would need another body, and then another, preferably with faces that resemble hers. She always was. Terribly vain? No, 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 no. I refuse to believe it. I stand and find myself dizzily. Dizzy from the abrupt chance in altitude. Lucian reaches to steady me, but I shrug him off. I... I need my journal. Wait here. I dart out of the room, breathing hard and collapsing my hand over the mouth as I try to keep my sensation from sickness from spilling out. I keep the journal underneath my pillow. When I don't have it on hand, it doesn't take me long to retrieve it. My fingers are trembling as I slam my journal before us. This... Ophelia sent me this journal months after she left for the palace. Tell me, Lucius, would your queen await that long to consume her? Yes. The consumption of live essence is a gruesome spell, but it was one of her simpler ones. After some refinement, Queen Hildegard no longer needed her grimoire to cast it. Cast it. it only requires the amount of victim's hair as a conduit to be careful collected over a period of time. Abigail, you confirmed it for me what you said. It yourself, the woman on the throne is not your Ophelia. I knew this would cause you pain, I didn't want to tell you, but... But you said I would rather be curious, but I said I would rather be curious. I said I would rather know the truth. These throbbing, quivering ache behind my eyes, my thoughts are crashing together, and it's difficult to sting them into coherent words. My tingling skin feels increasingly numb. All I know for certain is I have no tears left to shed. Y you You didn't know for certain until you met me? My previous guests were either uneducated or thoroughly disinterested in politics. Many of them could not even read. The crown had been careful not to spend anyone not to send anyone who would who would rouse my suspicious, but she was careless when she met you. You're the only one to have known an Olivian queen prior to her reign, to have seen her before and after she took the throne, and you have now just enough, and you know just enough Illuvian history to help me complete this dreadful puzzle, Abigail. Will you tell me who the crown was after Queen Hildegard? Queen Ar Queen Artemisia Edgehaven. Indeed. Did she ever marry? No, she died young and I I left the throne to her sisters. That means Artemisia had no children. That was the name of a sister who ruled after her. Matilda, Queen Matilda Edgehaven. She the one who founded my orphanage. Yes. Nightingale Gardens, named as such for our father's affinity of songbirds. 
Not that Matilda would have spent enough time with her father to know such a thing. I must have made her very popular indeed when she declared the next crown would be chosen from there, routinely and and elevating commoners to nobility. She endeared herself to her people by choosing an orphan girl as a successor. Instead of numerous eligible candidates of grand dukes and counts, orphan girls would continue to be chosen for as long as the next monarch upholds the custom. Mathilda didn't even didn't even have hairs either, did she? To have three queens in a row so averse to childbirth. It's a strange pattern for a kingdom that once devoutly emphasizes divine birthright. Lucius. And I expect all the queens after them remain childless and unmarried, am I wrong? At first I thought I was delusional for even considering this possibility. I hoped I had too much time to think, to let me fancy to get away of me. But when you told me about Ophelia's changed demeanor... I'm truly, truly sorry, Abigail. It brings me no joy to reveal the truth, but I knew it'd be wrong to withhold it from you. So you're telling me that this, this century-old witch has been using my orphanage as some sort of blood-snatching orphan orchid where she could freely take her pick? All that bullshit about guaranteeing us a place in high society? All of, of her front so she, so she... So the queen could secure someone who would look similar to her? That Ophelia wasn't selected for intelligence or for her virtues, but so she... She could just be sacrificed for the queen? To wear a face? It is... Oh, it's a horrible accept. It's horrible to accept, as my hands curl into trembling fists, my nails dig, its, dig deep, half moon gorged my palm, the anger crackling through my bones, as it ridiculous, as it is unbearable. My emotions are useful and useless and fervid, like a bonfire caught into a, into a downpour. The throbbing ache behind my eyes feels incredibly hollow. Ophelia is dead then. She lived only in my thoughts because the, the thing murdered her and took her place. I feel like the biggest fool in the land. No, Abigail. Am I not? I've spent so long feeling sorry for myself, so long missing her and crying like a child all this time. She was never alive to know. What did she ever do to deserve such a fate? Why her? Lucius gives me a long, pained look. We both know the reason. Neither of us wishes to voice it out loud. As if the senseless tragedy caused by a self-serving witch would hurt less this anyway. I belt out a bitter, mirthless laughter, pressing my palms against my eyes. The thing that I've never seen her again. Not to reel her, I correct myself quietly. Abigail. Abigail, look at me. Lucia sets a portrait down, shifting to kneel before me to catch my gaze, but I can't even meet him halfway. My vision is swimming, pitch black at the edge of my, as I glare at the portrait with newfound hatred. I stare back at me, it stares back at me with those dead eyes, dark and domineering. This wretched woman, this witch stole Ophelia from me. She stole the throne from her own son, and if she isn't stopped, she'll go on to steal the futures of countless more girls. But what can I possibly do to stop her? This humiliating powerlessness makes me realize why Lucius tore the drawing to shred. I'm tempting to seize it and launch it right into the fireplace myself. Could I have helped her escape if I knew the truth sooner? Is there anything I could do and is there anything I could have done to save Ophelia? Does anyone know how much evil this woman has inflicted on her own kingdom, aside from the vampire prince she'd forsaken? Lucius grinningly takes my hand in his home, but I'm too numb to reciprocate. The artist took a great pain to draw attention to her loathsome face. Did Gillian know how vile this beast had captured on parchment when he rendered it likeness? He knew she was my mother and that she was the one who banished me, but he never learned the full contest, the context. You were the only one I've trusted enough to... He trails off, perhaps second-guessing his decision to confine me. Part of me wants to smile for him, even though 
It's willing weavers, too soothe him even though my voice will crack, but I'm still unable to tear my eyes from the portrait. The delicate, gla the delicate lace trace him on the dress and the gemstone of the queen's crown have been smudged, but the, but the pendant was carefully carved into the parchment with dark, deterring lines. I squint harder at it. How had I noticed before? Keep safe. What? The symbol, Lucius. What is the meaning of the symbol? I reach for the portrait. The thing bettered of it and flip over my songwriting journal for him. There on the page beneath the lead leather bound cover is a red ink design that matches its charcoal counterpart. The bejeweled pendant encircling my knotted half wreathed of thorns. What? Lucius lunges as it means to stand, but lands back down to study my journal with increasing agitation. What? It can't be. His eyes are wide and darting as he looks at me, caught somewhere between pleading and thoroughly rattled. Abigail, can I take a closer look? My throat clenches tight with instinctively apprehension. I've never allowed anyone to look at my journal. Touching it has been completely out of the question, but... I need to know the truth. I, I, I want to trust Lucius to help me find it. All these years keeping my journal safe, of keeping myself safe, I wonder if I've been waiting for the reckoning for this very moment. With worthless reluctance, re re reluctance, I place the book in his waiting hands. Lucius immediately stands, pacing and holding it with unease re reverence. He turns his pages more hastily by the second. Why do you have this? How long? How long have you been... How... You've been writing over this damn thing? He tangled his finger through the hairline, leaving frayed, frazzled strands in his wake as, the f as he flips back to the inside cover. Lucius faces me with mystified scowl. The symbol. It is the symbol of her pact. The deal the queen made when she sacrificed part of her soul to augment her magical powers. This... To make this. He shuts the book and holds it up, shaking it with grave emphasis. The Infernal Grimoire. But the cover is different. Why is the cover different? What happened to it? And you? You took it everywhere, Abigail. Through mud and, and prison cells and tavern brawls. Gods in heaven. You had it with you when you performed before my mother. Oh, wait, wait, what? Slow down. How can I be? How can how can it be the same grimoire? What is? It, it was, it was completely blank, other than Ophelia's note to keep safe, or, or to keep it, to keep to keep myself safe. I was never quite sure which. Lucius humored me, by re re examining the inside cover of the book. After a moment, he scoffs out loud. Then he begins to laugh, deflating beside me and on velvet chair. He laughs and laughs, his sagging shoulders quaking with bone weary hysteria. The fades are terribly thicker, aren't they? You weren't wrong about her after all, Abigail. Your Ophelia was as sharp as a knife. And it seems she did her part in changing Eluvia's future. She did? Lucius taps the book a few a few times against Palm, as if she reluctant the part with Pirit. Still, she doesn't take long. He doesn't take long. Longer than a heartbeat to hand it to me. This is... All you remember by her, isn't that right? You should hang on to this book. You have been marvelous, marvelous at taking, at caring for it this far. There's no reason for you to stop now. There's a small confusing pang in my chest as I accept it from him. I leave through its pages, marveling at it with secrets they just hold. First she steals food from an orphanage, then she steals a grimoire from a witch's queen. It sounds far from the core, wouldn't you say? Mother must have been furious. I linger on the inside cover one more time. Keep safe. As I bore down on those bin banning little words, Lucius drags his forefinger along the inside seam. You see it? The dread the thread is exposed and loosened here. The color doesn't match the rest of the book. Ophelia must have waited for the queen to leave the grimoire unattended. Much like I did. She replaced the cover to hide her swapping ruse as for long as possible. Even if 
Even if the queen sent her entire army to search for the grimoire, they would not know what to look for. They would not know its new appearance. Be that it may be, why in heavens would Ophelia go through the trouble of stealing it and sending it to me? If she discovered the queen's shame, why did she flee the place? Why didn't she flee, flee the palace and save herself? You know her much better than I ever will, Abigail, but let's say she did successfully escape, despite the queen's best effort to hurt her down the down and detain her. What do you think would happen afterwards? Your mother's re relentless, isn't she? If so, she would have found another girl. Someone else would have sufficed Ophelia's place. Would your Ophelia have allowed that to transpire? Another pang ripples my chest. A choke noise escapes me as part as, as my lips speak. Lu Lucius reaches out to me once more to hold my hand, grounding me with a sympathetic grip. A faint thought, a faint, though a faint thought crossed my mind like a whisper. That he of all people knows what it's like to lose someone he loved. I, un I unfurl my fingers just enough to gently squeeze back. Ophelia liked to inconvenience others sometimes, but she never wanted to cause any in actual harm. She would have done anything in her power to avoid it. I suspected as much. Beneath her veneer of being a cunning little scoundrel, I believe you said she was kind. Perhaps this prompted her to send the grimoire to only to the only orphan in Luvia who both despised Nightingale Garden and was fiercely protective of her belongings. So protective in fact that she refused to trade her loot to a vampire in exchange of her freedom. I think Ophelia trusted you resist and those in power, Abigail. My lip quiver. I, I look away from this haste. This merciful he no longer pleads with me to make my eye- Whoa! Back again. My lips quiver, I look away from him in haste, and mercifully, he no longer pleads with me to make eye contact. All these years of carting around this wretched book, carrying out his command of these two hastily scrabbled words, it was rarely gratifying, but it felt, it always felt so stupidly important. But now Lucius is telling me that maybe, just maybe, it wasn't as stupid as I thought. I don't know if this speculation words are true but this logic has a sense of significant and fate i have to admit it's appealing to hear even reality of what happens align with what he believes there's no reason she didn't destroy it isn't there the grimoire i mean you don't know how would i know such a thing i'm i'm, I'm not a witch i'm not a witch's research assistant my tone is snappier than i intended Forgive me, I... Magic was not uncommon, but I thought precautions against magic were fairly rudimentary. I truly mean no offense. I... I forgive you. I'm sorry too, I'm, I'm, I meant to tease you, but it seems it did not land. His lips quirk into half-hearted grin. Our banter is a short-lived slip into normalcy. He can tell me I'm still hurting. Destroying a grimoire releases the power containing within. The queen's soul will be restored, and she will be free to create a second grimoire. When I was mortal, we refrained from destroying books for this very reason. One never knows if an infernal pact is sealed in its passage. Keeping grimoires far away from the realists is the best way to cut down their powers, and you, Abigail, you perform the task splendidly. Ophelia would be so proud of you. I exhale a sharp, shuddering breath that grazes the inside of my chest like a reddened of thorns. This is my cue to break down, to impassionate sobbing. I think, mooring every memory and lost memory I failed to treasure when Ophelia was alive. Although I picture myself in that state of breaking beautifully, my tear ducked remained relentlessly, shamefully dry, and my mind is once more abuzz with growing noise. Can we use this, Lucius? Nigramar, is there anything in there that can restore my friend? Lucius' eyes shrink with inward anguish, but he does not look away. He meets my wavering gaze with stealing resolve. Queen Hildegard was interested only in prolonging her life, not in cheating death. 
She never worked on such spell, to my knowledge, and I myself only studied in passing. I heard necromancy is ghastly, unrewarding art form. You can restore one's body, but a spirit once departed from his soul for good. I... I see. I suppose Ophelia wouldn't want to come back anyway. Not if it meant losing an integral part of who she was. That's what I need to tell myself if I want to move on. What would the point be of reanimating a corpse if it didn't have her in it? In my own way, I already mourned her that day she left the orphanage. Perhaps some part of me never stopped. Still, it's crushing to accept that this loss is a permanent one. Lucius watches me for a while, shouldering slumped. Abigail. If I may offer a rather more selfish suggestion, there are other spells we may use to our benefit. Lucius hesitates before carefully correcting himself. To my benefit. Even now, he, ex he, ex he he's exercising restraints, folding his arms against his chest with humility when he embraced me with such passion not so long ago. It reminds me of how he kept his distance at the start of my stay, and in alarming deduction, I realize that he's holding himself back out of consideration for me. Both then and now, he wanted me to feel safe enough to say no. I was afraid he would hurt me when, he, when I first met him. My bias, formed by the outside world, ensured I would fear him when I first met him. I was so afraid that he would hurt me that I felt little desire to understand him. Yet now, then I know him. I'm beginning to suspect that my feelings for him have bordered an unviolent adoration. There is no better antidote to fear than him. There is no better uh, antidote to fear than that. My heart remains heavy. I expect I will remain for. S I expect it will remain so for some time. But somehow, at the same time, it's still full of bursting. As I lean closer to him. I can feel his lashes against my brow as, I for as our foreheads meet softly. Abigail. My feelings towards you are unchanged, Lucius. I still care for you. Thank you for sharing everything with me. I can't imagine how hard it must have been to make that decision. Why don't you look so surprised? Why do you look so surprised? I was never upset with you, you know. I you weren't the one who killed all those girls. You didn't kill Ophelia. But I... He trails off when I wrinkle my nose at him, possibly because he knows now viciously I would argue with him if he tries to list any self-accusation's sort of crimes. You have a unique talent in making me consider what I'm about to say. You even render me speechless sometimes. Ah, sounds like I was right. Allow me to settle with saying this, Abigail. I do not wish to ask anything of you. I love you. But I know you will need some time to grieve. I will. I'll have plenty of time to do so. After you tell me how we can use the Grimard to our benefit. Very well. If I remember correctly, the Grimard contains the spell that was used to bind me to the coffin. Is that so? So you can benefit from... Binding me to... To keep you company as a cursed coffin comp... <laughs> binding me to keep you company as a cursed coffin companion? My voice is a bit less teasing than I expected, and Lucius doesn't take a hint, looking horrified. N no, Abigail, don't be foolish, absolutely not. I would never wish such a fate on you. I am saying that, that I may be able to break the curse if I can study how it works. Can you do that? I believe so. I have no talent for devising my own spell, but r re reversing one is far simpler than casting one. Lucius, that would be incredible, that means... No more claustrophobic night terrors. No more pained grimaces, what else? My thoughts race and tangle with possibilities, but they, they'll arrive at a single resounding conclusion. Lucius, would you be able to leave this estate, wouldn't you? We could, we could leave together. The tunnels will be a daunting venture, but... Yes, if it works, I would no longer be bound to this estate. I could accompany you if you would still have me. Of course I would! I paused for a moment, collecting my thoughts. My grip firms on my journal. What about... I gesture at him. With a small pain smile, he shakes his head. No. Even my mother couldn't resist it, and... 
As strange as it may sound, I don't think I wish to be a vampire anymore. I've been part of who I am for so long. If I lost this, I'm afraid I wouldn't know how to be myself anymore. Did I read that right? Yeah, I did read that right. Gently, I put my hand on his to squeeze it. I understand and I love you the way you are. Sorry for asking. No need to apologize, Abigail. Your curiosity was legitimate and I know you meant well. Even so, I, uh... This time, he's the one stopping me from saying nonsense by pressing his lip against mine. Overwhelmed by the lot of conflicted emotions, I close my eyes and deepen the kiss. Everything is still a little fuzzy in my head, the Queen, Ophelia, the spellbook, but at least I find comfort in being with Lucius. My hand slides through his hair, clutching it between my fingers to keep him from moving away from me. No matter what lies ahead, at least, we will be together. Breaking the spell was no small task. It wasn't... I wasn't much help and Lucius' memory was distant and fragmented. But with time and patience we managed to decipher all the spells in the book until we find the right one. Part of me was unwilling to trust anything from what accursed grimoire, but I could sense how eager Lucius was to attempt it. Despite my reservations, I couldn't keep him waiting. Every night his cries reminded me of what was at stake. Whatever happened would not be worse than what was already enduring. My fears were baseless. After an exhausting ceremony that required far too much blood of my liking, Lucius was released. The scourge lifted his coffin and burst into the flames, leaving only a pile of ash behind as a reminder of his long suffering. Although he knew that nothing kept him from his old prison anymore, it took him several days to attempt walking through the tunnels. The water still distressed him, and only my pressure at his si presence at his side gave him the strength to venture under the moat hand in hand. With both of us now free to travel, I, look him in the, I took him to the neighboring kingdom. It was my greatest joy to show him the most astonishing wonders that I had seen I had seen in the vast landscapes that he had been missing for so many years. I wasn't afraid when Lucius punctured my, f my flesh. I wasn't afraid when Lucius punctured my flesh and drank deeply from me. I knew what I wanted and I wouldn't be denied. I would have eternity by his side, even if it cost me the sun itself. My transformation was a gradual one. My skin slowly turned much paler than his, just as my heartbeat grew fainter and my hunger grew stronger. My fangs were by far the most uncomfortable change, and I wept as they punched, pushed and stained through my gums. However, after they had fully grown, I found them quite fetching. Living in the night did not trouble me, after all, night was the time when bards shone the brightest. No, the hardest trial of all was dealing with the bloodlust that had taken a hold of me. In spite of my strength of character, it was agony to resist. Every time I came across human beings, I could hear, no, I could feel their heart beating, and I could barely keep myself in check. Fortunately, Lucius was by my side through it all, taking care of me. Patiently, firmly, he had kept me from doing something I would forever regret. And when he, and when the bloodlust grew too strong, he accompanied me to a deserted forest, and we lived there for several months, away from the temptation. Every time he held me in his arms, whispering soothing words. I wouldn't help, I couldn't help my flowing, ear, my flowing tears, but I wasn't sobbing on my own account. Every time I could hear only think that he had endured it all by himself, alone. It was then, during those days away from civilizations, that I swore to myself I would never leave him alone anymore. Eternity was much too frightening to face on one's own. In time I managed to get that other part of me under control, and we were able to resume our travels. Each journey took us to a place more remote and dangerous. We never started fights ourselves, but the but a few pirates and bandits paid the price of underestimating us. Nothing can stand in our way except the sun. But I cherished every moment of daytime that I spent at Lucia's side, in quiet and dark places. Our bliss was complex, ex except for the time 
that news of Queen Ophelia or Hildegard reaches. Every time we heard her name, shivers took over my body. In those moments, desire for revenge obscured everything else, and we planned and we plotted. Which my newfound powers felt invincible between the two of us. We could surely defeat a witch deprived of her magical grimoire, and yet the risk of defeat still existed. And so every time, I ended up changing my mind. For one, I was not ready to look at this usurper in Ophelia's body. But most importantly, I knew that this was not what Ophelia would have wanted. She knew she would have wanted me to enjoy every moment of his life that Lucius and I had earned, and she would be heartbroken to see it's consumed by rage. I would not let it become that. No. Our life would be so consumed by love instead, the powerful love worthy of my most beautiful ballads, a love deep and true, an internal love. Freedom and Vampire That, my friends, was so beautiful! So beautiful! A small applause from me to the artists and story writers. Ah, it was wonderful, beautiful, I enjoyed the story. Oh my god, I would read a full book about that. How can those two... Maybe those two can... Hey guys, you can fantasy with it. Drop down the comments. They can probably, you know, create their own small empire bits by bit as the as they live through many years. They can grow and create a new empire um, and try to conquer the queen, the witch, and epic battles occur and everything else. Ah, oh, I keep on fantasizing. Amazing, guys. Anyways, thank you so very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, guys. Hope you had a wonderful time watching this short and beautiful story. As always, guys. Thank you so very much for watching, don't forget to give a like, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you in the next beautiful story. Have a good day everyone!